the easiest thing. The old man can't read his paper if we dim the lights. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much, Oliver. In a paper published in 1986, the late Patrick Wormwald suggested that Celtic kingship was not so different from Anglo-Saxon kingship, and by implication, from continental kingship in general. It was simply that the sources for one and the other differed so much in their purposes, I'm looking at Carsten now, so much in their purposes and in the emphases which they consequently gave. Such an approach is fully justified, I think, by various recent publications, notably Sarah Semple's Perceptions of the Prehistoric in Anglo-Saxon England earlier this year, which shows every bit as much attention being paid in the English world to the significance of prehistoric monuments in the landscape of much later sites, as is thought to be observable in the context of Irish and Scottish sites. This seems to me to be relevant in considering the Stone of Scoon. It is tempting to regard that enigmatic monument as an essentially Celtic phenomenon, at home in the world of Irish and Scottish inauguration sites. These, as we all know, had inauguration stones, like the stone with the footprint incised on it at Donad, or stone inauguration thrones, like that formerly at the Irish site of Talag Och. It is tempting to see the Stone of Scone as an example, equally, of a phenomenon characteristic of the peripheries of Europe, for a parallel which has been adduced to it is that of the inauguration site for the Dukes of Carinthia at Carnburg, in the far eastern extremities of the Austrian Alps, at the edge of the central stage of European politics, as represented by the great empires of Charlemagne and his successors, and ultimately by the Holy Roman Emperors and the Kings of France. There at Carnburg, the so-called Prince's Stone and the Duke's Throne, constructed of plates of stone with a stone seat, were used, according to the 14th century sources, in the inauguration of Duke Meinhardt II in 1286, when the practice may well have been already ancient, for there is what appears to be an account of their use for the inauguration of Duke Herman of Carinthia in 1161. But what I want to suggest to you this morning is that we should go back wholeheartedly to Wormwald's argument, an attempt to locate the Stone of Scone in the center stage of Europe, by means of finding for it precise parallels there, and not just comparisons in the form of inauguration sites like Rams and Arkham, as Stuart Airely did. If we can succeed, then we may be illuminating the ideas and practice of rulership in that central stage, as much as we shall be more effectively contextualizing the Stone of Scum itself. I want to start with actual stones, as distinct from stone thrones. Elizabeth Fitzpatrick argues that many Irish inauguration sites can be shown through place names and sometimes through remains to have been provided with layaka, that is, stone such as flagstones or huge stones, which played a role in inauguration rituals. They were, in other words, instruments for the transfer of power to the new ruler. The Stone of Scone fits, of course, into this context in view of its association with the inauguration of kings at Scone. But in looking for another powerful stone to parallel it, let me take you to the heart of that centre stage of Europe, and indeed to the epicentre of the great kingdom of France as it existed in the Middle Ages, that is, the Palais de la Cité, occupying part of the island at the main crossing point of the River Seine in the middle of Paris. Reaching back at least to the 11th century, this was a very grand royal palace by any standard. In the 13th century, it had added to it the magnificent Santa Chapelle of Louis IX, and in the 14th century, the immense Great Hall built by King Philip the Fair 
the undercroft of which survives. Yet, in a prominent position by the great staircase which led up to that hall, we know that there stood a great stone, or as the sources refer to it in old, in old French, a perron. This is mentioned, for example, in a journal contemporary with an insurrection of 12th June 1418, in the course of which the bodies of seven royal officers involved in the insurrection were shown, quote, at the foot of the staircase of the palace on the perron. This suggests that the perron was not itself a staircase, as some scholars have thought, but rather a great stone. It was a marble, because we have an account of how, in 1540, King Francis I of France received the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, at the foot of the great staircase, near the perron of marble. So at the Palais de la Cité, the perron was not even part of the staircase, but a completely separate feature. The passage just quoted might suggest that it was merely a block to assist a person mounting or dismounting from a horse. And indeed, in an epic poem, one of the chansons de geste in Old French, entitled The Capture of the City of Orange, written at the end of the 12th century or beginning of the 13th, one of the characters says that when he arrives in Paris, he will, quote, dismount on the enameled perron which is presumably the perron in the courtyard of the Palais de la Cité. But it is equally possible, perhaps more likely, in view of the prominence it is given in the texts, that it was much more than that. If the stone of Schoon and the Irish inauguration stones were objects of power, so too may have been this perron, a stone of justice, we might regard it as, for it formed a sort of platform from which announcements relating to the law could be made. There are records, for example, of, to the effect that the perron at the Palais de la Cité was one of the four places where the usher of the Parliament announced decrees and where publications of peace were broadcast by the herald at arms. The perron would then have been symbolic of power rather than a merely functional block of stone characteristic which may have been enhanced by the display on it of the bodies of the rebels in the text quoted earlier. There is nothing in the sources to suggest that this perron was used in any way as a throne. But it is striking that the one object known in contemporary sources as a perron actually to survive from the late Middle Ages is a stone with strong resemblances to a throne. It is the perron, which is now on the screen, at the Chateau de Coucy near Compiègne in the Ile de France, which Mary Whiteley compared with the perron in the Palais de la Cité. This has been little studied, to my knowledge, and is no doubt heavily restored. But it is striking that Supported with lions, as it is, you can see the, the lions are there, it is nevertheless basically a length of stone, a sort of flagstone, which forms a bench not entirely unsuitable to have been a throne. To find other perrons used as if they were thrones, however, we need to go into the world of French chanson de geste, just as Elizabeth Pat Fitzpatrick finds Leaka in the world of Irish sagas and saints' lives. And we need to go specifically to the Song of Roland, written around the year 1100. This epic poem concerns the end of a campaign fought by the Emperor Charlemagne in Spain, which was in his time largely in the hands of Muslim rulers. According to the poem, Charlemagne has reconquered all Spain from these Muslims, except for Zaragoza, which is ruled by a king called Marsilian, who persuades him to lead his army home, only to arrange 
for its rear guard to be attacked as it passes across the Pyrenees on its way back to France. The events narrated by the poem had some relationship to reality, insofar as Charlemagne really did conduct a campaign in Spain in the 780s, and his army really was attacked in the Pyrenees en route for hope, or at least that is the account of the animals composed at his court. But in the annals, the attackers were not the Muslim king of Zaragoza and his troops, as in the poem, but rather Christian Basques living in the area of the Pyrenees. Although the poem's history is therefore fictional, it is nevertheless entirely possible that the background detail given by the poet was authentic for his own time, that is, around the year 1100. It is therefore striking to find, at the very beginning, a passage describing how King Marsilian, the Muslim king of Zaragoza, was holding a council to discuss how to bring Charlemagne's campaign to an end. King Marsilian was at Zaragoza. He went into a garden of Bergier in the shade. He laid himself down on a great stone, a pearl of grey marble, marble of bois, with 20,000 of his men around him. He then consulted with his men as to how to get rid of Charlemagne. That this consultation was envisaged by the poet as a genuine council taking place around the king on his perrin is underlined in line 62, which reads, King Marsilian had brought his council to an end. The perrin was evidently serving as a throne. The representation by the poet of King Marsilian lying on it, rather than sitting on it, was probably the result of the poet's perception of Saracen Muslim customs. That was how Muslim rulers were envisaged as behaving, lying in an exotic Turkish manner. Another perron occurs in the, in, in, in the Chanson de Geste, the capture of the city of Orange, Orange, which I mentioned a moment ago. In this, the Christian Count William receives a knight at his palace at Nîmes in Provence, and in order to honour him, quote, sits beside him on a perron. This perron was also presumably serving as a throne in the garden, although Count William was not lying on it in the Turkish manner. The distinction between stones like this and stone thrones need not always have been great, for the Clan Isle of Buda stone inauguration chair from Castlereagh, now in the Ulster Museum, uh, is more, little more than a hewn block of stone. The bishop's throne at Hexham Abbey, an object of power from at least the 12th century, when it was where the highest form of sanctuary would, could be sought, is more regular and more decorated but it remains more of a stone than a throne. Indeed, that there could be ambiguity between stones and stone thrones is shown by the references to the stone of school in the sources as a stone, but also as a throne. And Elizabeth Fitzpatrick has argued for a process in Ireland by which plain inauguration stones could be replaced by stone thrones through the ambition of the rulers involved since we find stone thrones at places which have names referring only to stones. In the case of the Stone of Schoon, King Edward I's conviction that the right thing to do with it was to mount it in a throne at the coronation chair of Westminster Abbey, underlines the relationship between stones and thrones, even if in this case the chair constructed was itself of wood, originally intended to be of bronze rather than of stone. With this in mind, I should like to take us back again to centre stage of continental Europe and to two stone thrones, one much better known than the other. The less well-known one is the throne situated out of doors above the River Rhine at Rennes, 
just upstream from Koblenz and commanding views over the valley. Uh, you can see uh, the stairs leading up to the throne here. It was on this throne that the newly inaugurated King of the Romans, that is the Holy Roman Emperor in waiting, was required to sit at any rate in the 14th century. It formed a compulsory stopping point on his journey around uh, the kingdom, which he made after his election at Frankfurt and his coronation at Aachen. As appears from the old drawing and its modern manifestation, it is very heavily restored, no doubt in the period of high German romantic nationalism. But nonetheless, it seems clear that he was indeed a stone throne in an outdoor situation, and as such, not so very far removed from the Irish examples. The better known example is so well known that it perhaps needs no introduction. It is the throne in the Western Gallery of what I'm going to call, in light of recent publications, St Mary's Church, <laughs> which was, among other things, the church of Charlemagne's palace at Aachen, at the very heart of his empire. That church, which largely survives, has been the subject of intensive and effective research in recent years, which has led to a series of publications, the most recent a volume of papers on it published in this very year. I hesitate to speak about it with two leading exponents, Judith and Carsten, in the audience, but it does seem to me that its throne, at any rate, requires some thought in the contextualization of the stone of school. This throne, is, of course, an indoor rather than an outdoor throne. Entering the church, you see running round the polygonal nave, we're looking east uh, from the entrance, western entrance, round the polygonal nave, a gallery, separated from the nave space by elaborate bronze grills, which are themselves original to the church. The throne sits in the western part of this gallery, I'm sure you've seen these photographs, photographs as before, we are looking across uh, a gallery level, and there you can see in the western gallery at uh, the throne located. It is mounted, as you can see, on a stone base, supported, you'll see in a moment, on four columns, and accessible by a series of stone steps, uh, mostly now restored, but on, on good ground. The grill in front of the throne has a gate. You can see it open in this slide, which opens to give a view from the throne down to the original site of the high altar. Behind the throne, you can just see it with the red cloth on it to the left of this slide, behind the throne is the altar of St. Lucasius, which was erected in the later Middle Ages. The volume that I mentioned, published this year on St Mary's Church, contains a paper about the throne by Yuval Lobedy, which allows us to get closer to it than has previously been possible, in terms of how it was constructed and what its features are. Lobedy explores in detail three aspects of the throne. First, it's rough and almost makeshift character. The base plate that the throne sits on, the base plate here, the base plate has had its mouldings cut away at some point where it joins the steps. You can see uh, the cutting away here. Moreover, it is in two parts. I'll, I'll, sorry, I'm losing my place inside. Yes, there's a detail of the base plate, and you can see the mouldings cut away uh, on, on, on both sides. Moreover, it's in two parts, as this remarkable view down into the inside of the throne from Lobody's paper shows. We're looking down inside the throne to the top of the base plate. And it was consequently necessary to use metal brackets to fix them together. You can see uh, that here, as well as um, a rough hollowing out in the middle there to accommodate wooden pegging, possibly also to fix some other structure into the throne. So first, rough character. Secondly, 
The slabs of marble which form the sides and back of the throne are not only spolia, reused from some Roman structure, but they have not been very much finished for their incorporation into the throne. They have been shaped, you can see the detail here, they have been shaped to form the arms and back, although really quite crudely and without decoration. And they still have on them Roman graffiti, including a gaming board, uh, which you can perhaps just about make out, uh, I, I think you can't actually, um, uh, on this face of the right side. Thirdly, there are clear indications that the throne was used as a relic in its own right. For the passage underneath the base plate, uh, by, made by its elevation on the four pillars, shows polishing on the stones created by pilgrims crawling along it. There you can see the way under the throne. Here is the base plate. Here is the altar of St. Nicasius. The steps are in this direction. That's the beginning of them. And here is this passageway under the throne. Uh, by pilgrims crawling along it, as they are documented as having done in the later Middle Ages. And mouldings have been cut away to give more space for this crawling, which was, of course, a penitential activity. Lobody's principal concern, as has been that of previous scholars discussing the throne, is the question of its date. Sure, it is argued, it must be too rough to have been designed for the magnificent decorated church which Charlemagne had built, with its splendid bronze grills and bronze doors and its rich decorations which so impressed contemporaries. Surely, the cutting about and adaptation of the base plate and the marble sides and back must indicate at least that the throne was modified at various points, perhaps being raised onto the pillars, as Lobody suggests, only as a response to Charlemagne's canonization in the 12th century. These observations of Lobody's are thought-provoking, but there remains the case for the throne for all its oddities being original to the church's construction. Because of the gates, particularly opening in the bronze grill below it, to facilitate the occupant's view of the altar. The grills are certainly original to the church. And although it is true that we cannot be certain that the section of the grill with the gate in it is in its original position in the gallery, it is not easy to see what possible function it could have had at any other openings onto the nave. If the throne is original, or even if it belongs rather to the 10th century, for the account of Viducum de Corvai of the coronation of Otto I at Arken in 936 strongly suggests that by then it was in its present position, then those of us interested in the stone of Scoon should be struck not only by the Arken throne's makeshift character, but also by its unusual character. So far as we can tell, thrones from medieval Europe were not generally like this, not constructed, in other words, of great plates of marble, as this one was. In the churches of the 12th century kings of Sicily, at Palermo, and at Monreale, for example, what we find is throne platforms, handsomely decorated and with magnificent backdrops. And on these throne platforms, it was clearly intended that a portable or folding throne should stand, as has been reconstructed in Monreale. A Carolingian example of such a folding throne is the so-called Throne of Dagobert, which, at, which was at Saint-Denis in the 12th century, when the abbot Suchet considered it as the throne on which the King of France sat after his coronation to receive homage. That is not to say that there are no parallels to the Arkham throne, but they seem to be connected to it in very specific ways. The throne in the 11th century German palace of Goslar, for example, seems to resemble the Arkham throne, as is evident in this replica of it. It too, as the slide shows, has stone sides and back, but it is much more elaborately decorated than the Arkham throne, and in any case, Goslar was a palace in many ways built in imitation of Arkham, so that the similarities between this throne and the one at Arkham rather underline the latter's distinctiveness. Another parallel for Arkham, 
The Episcopal throne in the east end of San Vitale in Ravenna is problematic because it is certainly a modern reconstruction. But even if it is based on an original feature of the church, it is striking that San Vitale was one of the buildings which probably influenced the design of the Church of Arkham in general. Aside from these, the closest parallels to the Arkham throne were bishop's thrones, such as the one preserved in fragmentary form in Norwich Cathedral. But these generally do not much resemble the Arkham throne in detail, as is shown by these examples from Regensburg and from Canosa. If the Arkham throne then was unusual, we should also be struck by how eminently unsuitable it was as a throne in the materials it used and the way it was designed. You could not even sit on it without the support of a rather basic arrangement of three wooden boards installed into it, because the use of the marble slabs did not allow you to create a stone seat. You could not joint those marble slabs so that they had to be held together with unsightly metal straps. There must surely have been some compelling reason to use these marble slabs as the basis of the throne, or at least to construct a throne, which must have given the overwhelming impression that they were of great significance. Surely, the impulse to construct th a throne so important, and given the materials used, so impossible to raise to the decorative standards of the rest of the church, must have been significant. In a paper published in 2000, Sven Schurter suggested that they may have come from Jerusalem and have been relics in their own right. But he has never published the study of the throne on which he claimed this suggestion was based, and Lobody has dismissed uh, his conjecture as fantasy. Nevertheless, the use of these marble remains is thought-provoking, for the throne was certainly treated as a relic and an object of pilgrimage in its own right. Maybe this was simply to do with the fact that Charlemagne was believed to have sat on it. He was certainly regarded as a saint from the time of his canonization in the 12th century, and probably from much earlier, so that the throne was thus a secondary relic of him. But, if there was something special about the marble slabs forming the throne, there was more to it than that. And we are faced with the intriguing possibility that here, in the gallery of the Church of Arkham, at the heart of the Carolingian Empire, at the site which became the essential coronation place of medieval German rulers, at the centre stage of European politics, we may have something which is not so far from the world of the Stone of School, a special stone <coughs> which, however unsuitable for the purpose, was built into a throne, at least by its despoiler, Edward I. It is striking, then, that the Irish royal inauguration site of Tullach Och uh, was drawn by Richard Bartlett in 1602 with a throne, perhaps raised on a mound, with stone plates for back and side. Aside from the fact that the throne has a stone seat rather than the wooden seat which supported the occupant at Arkham, this is remarkably reminiscent of the Arkham throne. Maybe Bartlett knew the latter, and, was in, and his, it, this influenced his representation of the Tullach Ock throne. Maybe the we kneelers, we kneel rulers, knew it when the throne was created and they imitated it. But the parallelism between Tullach Ock and Arkham surely calls for further pondering of Wormald's argument that the distinction between Celtic kingship and the rest of Europe is more an illusion than a reality. We need, however, to take that discussion a step forward. The differing viewpoints of the sources, which for Wormald accounted for the apparent distinction between Celtic and non-Celtic, may also point to differing perceptions of what kingship rituals involved, even in the same kingdom. In other words, not all contemporaries need have seen kingship in the same way. In considering, say, French or English or Bohemian kingship, scholars have often been influenced by texts emanating from the most senior levels of the church, interpreting kingship and its rituals as fundamentally Christian. 
That was no doubt what churchmen believed and wanted everyone else to believe. But there may nevertheless have been those, perhaps the ruler himself, who perceived other strands in kingship and its rituals, strands which may have been common to Europe, but which it did not suit the churchmen to emphasize. And even within Christian attitudes, those of rulers may have differed from those of churchmen, as Georges Dagon argued so compellingly for the relationship between the view of the ruler held in the imperial palace at Constantinople and that held in the nearby church at Hagia Sophia. The often priestly garb assumed by the king at his inauguration may fall into this category when contrasted with churchmen's insistence that the king was in no way a sort of priest. Stones, stone thrones, and customs and ritual which did not have an obviously Christian basis may similarly reflect different attitudes to kingship. And contemporary writers may have emphasized those elements of kingship which best served their view of what kings ought to have been, just as the stones and stone thrones served to emphasize a different view. Thank you very much. <laughs>